This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're ruminating with Ray. Ruminating with Ray. You like that? Ray Tsuchiyama. He's an informed citizen, and he's also CEO of uh, Tsuchiyama and Associates here on Think Tech Global on a given Monday. And we're talking about Xi Jinping today. Xi Jinping is not all sweetness and light. You agree, Ray? Well, he's brought back a concept, I think, uh, that um, the last uh, few Chinese leaders uh, were focusing on the economy, really. And when you talk to people uh, from years back in China, they would say, oh, uh, economy first, politics second. And the, the, those were cold words, so we have to delay democracy. We have to delay uh, opposition parties. We have to delay even voting for your mayor of a small town. I mean, uh, here in the US or, or in Japan or uh, EU countries or even India, you get to elect uh, whom you want to represent you as a leader in your town or village or in, in the federal government, but not China. There's all, still only one communist party that seems to be even coalescing, even firmer in his grip on the society. Well, the success of the, uh, the success of the leadership in China is a direct function on their success. I mean, the power of leadership right. is direct function. If they're successful, if the economy is successful, they'll they'll stay in office. And and the uh, the old notion is that in China, you you reserve the right to upend the government if it's impoverishing you, if the economy is not working, and it's working. Well, I mean, it's a uh, remarkable well, success. Historically, that's called the mandate of heaven. You're absolutely right. And uh, if you had the mandate of heaven, the emperor was uh, like, was godlike. Uh, uh, the society worked, and and uh, and uh, people will tell you China is a big country with um, um, many people, the most populous country, and and has uh, all kinds of issues trying to hold it, it together as a, as a as a country. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, if you had an election right now today in China, I mean, a popular election, not that it doesn't work that way, you know. Right. Uh, but, it, you know, what happens is the guy at the bottom vote right. for one tier, right. and that tier votes for the next tier, and so forth. So the guys at the bottom have very little to do with direct election of anybody. Um, but, uh, and they know, they, it's all kind of a game. But, um, but it, you know, if you did have a direct election right now today in China, he would win hands down. He's a popular guy. Well, uh -huh. and, and it goes back to the economy. I mean, the economy for the last uh, 10 years have been at a, you know, like a developmental state, 6%, 8%, even as much as 10% in some years. And this year will be a low uh, year, maybe only 6 to 7%. Yeah. Wow. Uh, countries in the EU would die for that kind of uh, growth well, rate. Well, the U.S. is down <laughs> at about 2 and change. That's right. Uh, Japan is barely 1% or yeah. uh, less. India is qu doing quite well, maybe 6 to 7% this year. But the uh, bulk of the EU countries are barely between 1 to 3% at most. Uh, you're correct. And so China is the engine of economic growth in many ways for the entire globe. Yes, I, I agree. And so, you know, he would win, and he is in his own way popular. But what's really interesting is that while all this popularity, call it sweetness and light, takes place, and while the economy is going gangbusters, relatively speaking, um, civil rights in China are actually rolling back. You know, the, and I, I referred to a very powerful speech given at the China seminar by uh, Richard Hornick uh, only two weeks ago. And which is playing now in large part on OC16, on our Think Tech on OC16 show um, through this week. And it was a shockeroo for me because I, I was under the assumption that with all the sweetness and light in the economy, there was also sweetness and light in the way the government was treating the people. Not. You know, this is very mm, rollback time in China, where before you had academic freedom, where before you had hope into the future for the civil rights and the engagement of the citizen with the government, um, it's not like that anymore. Now, they're not complaining, most of them, because it's successful in the economy. But in fact, they're losing their right to speak. They're losing, what, what he called his speech was um, something about mind control, China controlling minds. First thing that happens a few years ago is all of a sudden academic freedom goes away. And if you want to speak against the government in the privacy of your class, before you can say anything you want in your class, it was a sort of sanctified territory. Now you say anything and somebody is recording you, the university is recording your remarks. It's pretty, <coughs> pretty scary. And these students are encouraged to re <coughs> report you. 
um, and, and to the authorities. And then what happens is you lose your job, you, you lose whatever perks and benefits you might have, um, and, and you have to follow his line. Xi Jinping is making himself Mao. You know, he, he built himself into the Constitution now that Xi Jinping thought, you know, is sanctified thought in the Constitution. This is new. Nobody's had this benefit since Mao. Even Deng Xiaoping, who was, who right. was a, you know, a, a remarkable leader in China and put more people out of poverty than anyone in the history of the world, according to Richard Hornick, um, he didn't do that. Um, but now Xi Jinping is ascending the Mao throne and at the same time, it's, it's beyond rooting out corruption, it's rooting out independent thought. And it's not only in the universities, I mean, you, you, we were comparing notes before, um, it's like in your daily life. It's what you read, what you say in any context, uh, what the government, when the government watches you, what the government finds about your habits and, you know, where you go, what you do, everything. The government knows everything. This is out of George Orwell's 1984, really. And that affects your ability to get goods and services. For example, um, and Richard talked about this, um, there's a brand new speed train, right? Oh, beautiful, it's beautiful, it costs a lot of money, goes between, what, Beijing and Shanghai, I think, at high speeds, it's an example of high technology, and you know, the best that China can, anyone can offer in the way of speed trains in the world. If you have a, a low quotient in terms of government faithfulness, you can't get on the train. This is really scary. So we're separating citizens for those who believe and follow the party line and those who don't. It's really scary. This is, diminishes free speech big time. So that's of great concern. You have to watch the show. It's, it's on okay, uh, OC16 yeah. now this week. It'll be over, but we'll upload it to YouTube after a while. You can see what he was saying. It was a shocker root to me because I had no idea this was going on. And, and what this means is that while he's successful with the economy, He's also taking over and making himself a leader for the millennia. I mean, you know, it was supposed to be five years. Now it looks like he's going to wangle another five years out of that. Uh, the Politburo is going along with him on everything, um, including his own deification. My goodness gracious. Um, di dictatorships seem to be rising in this world today, Ray. Well, I think uh, I would say that China for decades under the Communist Party has been scared of its own people. And uh, that's why I think um, it's taking a, a extreme through uh, Xi Jinping now, right now that with uh, access to information that it becomes even more imperative to control the populace, to control uh, the uh, citizenry in how they think because once you uh, have access to information, then you may think of organizing your opposition party or, th or having uh, more strength to uh, really uh, 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 declare war on environmental issues that, that China has, has neglected or the rights of minorities in China, ethnic minorities, and of course, the uh, large um, uh, issue that hasn't really been played uh, up in that in the Constitution, uh, officially, it's atheism, uh, no form of religion. But there are many people in China who are not turning to Christianity. Uh, and, and uh, of course, Buddhism, Taoism, um, and other religions. And of course, uh, Tibetans are very, very linked to their own Buddhist uh, religion and the Dalai Lama. These are all anti-Communist Party, when you think about it, because you have allegiance to a church, a god, even to the pope, which, which is very scary. So I think those are uh, initiatives to really crack down on information. Still Facebook, Google, many uh, uh, informational networks are banned in China. There are ways to get around. You know, people talk about this and laugh about this all the time. But still, uh, I think it's a concerted effort to really uh, uh, rein in uh, free thinking. Yeah, well, it's a, a virtual private networks is an interesting yeah. example of that. Um, you know, uh, I remember back in my, my travel time to China, everybody had them. Right. Uh, yeah. There were people selling them and VPNs, buying them. VPNs, right. A VPN, and you'd have a dish, and you could right. look outside of the closed system, internet system in China. Um, and it was a joke. Everybody treated <laughs> it as a joke, you know? Um, but it's not a joke anymore. Right. And somebody was recently put in jail for five years for selling one of those things. 
And, and you can say, well, uh, that's just one case. Well, it's more than one case. What it means is sending a message to 1.4 Chinese citizens, bil billion Chinese citizens, they shouldn't do that go to jail. Right. Um, so, you know, I think things are changing around things we thought were jokes. You know, the, the Chinese government, the Chinese police and, you know, intelligence agencies, oh, that's just them. They can do anything about it. We, we make fun of them. You know, um, for example, uh, it, was, uh, it was in August of 1989 with Tiananmen Square. Right. And so now this big thing goes on the internet instead of tanks in that forbidden picture. <laughs> Now that's, right. it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, a car cartoon right. character, <laughs> yeah, and well, making fun. Yeah. You know, yeah, you that, cannot, that was you, taken off the net almost right. immediately. You cannot search for certain uh, uh, words or phrases. Tiananmen Square, for example, in China, yeah. it will come back, and they will start looking for you because you have started to Google something or search for something that is anti-Chinese uh, state. Yeah, so, and anything that smacks of anti-Chinese state, like this joke with the, the three ducks with, right. was Winnie the Pooh, I think. And so all of a sudden, Winnie the Pooh went on the forbidden list, and now you can't search for Winnie the Pooh on the internet. Really? <laughs> I mean, all these things, it's, it's controlling the Chinese mind. That's what Richard was talking about. Incidentally, he's going to be in the show well, good. sometime in a few weeks. And, and, and remember, um, you know, China is a country that has grievances, you know, and, and it plays up these grievances from the Opium War, 1840s, to the destruction of the Summer Palace by the British uh, in the 1880s, and the Boxer Rebellion, of course, to all the Japanese invasions of the 1930s, and what they perceive is the uh, almost imminent you know, attack on China through Korea by, by American uh, UN forces in 1950. So uh, all of this is, they're paranoid in a way that uh, uh, in, in some ways that the whole world gangs up on them uh, through history. Uh, but at the same time, well, I, I mean, think back when it was true, wasn't well, it? Well, uh, you, you're that's right. Early 20th and century. It, it was the pillaging of China when China really lost uh, its state, uh, statehood. And, uh, that the empire really was shrinking and had to give up uh, rights to uh, port uh, cities like Hong Kong and uh, Tianjin and others who went to the French or British or, or Americans so, and Japanese. And so they're definitely afraid of other states coming in and carving up China uh, to make you know, uh, the sick man of Asia again. Uh, but at, at the same time, there are citizens that I talk to my Chinese friends all the time. And, and, and some of them say, you know, we really, uh, although the government uh, talks about being the anti-Japanese, you know, uh, uh, movement from time to time, they kind of bring it up, we really envy Japan. I said, well, how do you envy Japan? They said, well, Japan is a country where it's very high tech, but it's a democracy, and they also retain their tradition and history. Ah, good point. Yes. Interesting <laughs> point. And they are. You don't uh, have to do brainwash. No, no. To, to they be are happy. very. And Japanese are quite proud of being Japanese. Uh, they do not are not overly religious, but yet are very. Uh, they go to uh, shrines and temples yeah. and can marry and vote any yeah. way they want. And to. they're devoted to the country. And they're devoted. Uh, they're very patriotic, and, and they are not warlike to other countries, and uh, have a great economy. And uh, also, they've cleaned up. Tokyo, I mean, uh, 30 years ago, it was a mess. Uh, lots of pollution and so forth. As Beijing is today, all the factories are moved out to the countryside or overseas. And so people enjoy a high standard of living. And, and uh, it's, it's a very orderly, clean country. And that's what the Chinese have to encounter every day when they look at vegetables. Is it contaminated? <laughs> is the meat OK? Uh, is the uh, you know, air pollution, is it go, okay, okay to go out in the street uh, today? Um, all these things figure in their uh, you know, daily lives. Yeah. Well, let's talk about One Belt, One Road for a minute. Um, you know, I remember one, we had a lawyer exchange program. One of the lawyers from Beijing was a fairly young woman. She was around 30. And, she, and she, what did she do? She, well, she represented all of Chinese interests. CIDIC, CIDIC, right, 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 right. The Chinese yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a business development right, right. Uh, agency in the state, in the, in the government there. Um, she represented all the civic deals in Africa. I said, what? All the civic <laughs> deals in Africa? Um, well, civic, I mean. Um, well, that's what her job was. Now, she was related to a general, so I guess that's okay, you know, to be expected. But the fact is that they're in Africa big time. Oh, yes. They're in, and that was 10 years ago. Yeah. 
um, they're in every country and they're making deals with every country and they're doing what I guess they see as soft power. Right. You know, the Kennedy School kind of soft power. Um, but, but in fact, I think it's a little harder than soft power. Look at the South China Sea. I mean, it's, it's manifest destiny. With us, manifest destiny was reaching the West Coast, you know, <laughs> or maybe, you know, fighting the Spanish-American War in the Pacific but, <clears throat> and in the, in the Caribbean. But, um, you know, for them, it's, uh, it's, it's crossing the world. It's going global. And I find that very interesting that the one belt, one road, um, you know, business in Africa, influence in Africa, uh, investment, and the investment becomes a kind of political influence investment. Um, they're everywhere doing that. Southeast Asia is easy, but, right. you know, all across the world, they're doing that. And, and uh, a lot of this is happening under Xi Jinping. So he's really doing gangbusters in terms of advancing China's diplomatic interest, its investment interest, its business, its trade interest. Um, he's really, he's becoming a global figure. China is becoming a global leader right now. And when we get back from this break, I want to talk to you about the juxtaposition of that and your favorite 45th president and see how that works, Ray. We'll be right back. This is the best part. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solutions. I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Uh, very, very okay, good. we're back. We're live with Ray Tsuchiyama. You know, we're sort of ruminating, Ray's ruminations, uh, you know, about, about China and Xi Jinping and about how, you know, there are multiple things happening with China, multiple but, threads. But if you're going to look historically, China, there was a time when China really went out into the world. Uh, the 15th century, there was an admiral, uh, her, from, uh, from China, went to the east coast of Africa. They're still digging up uh, pottery that he brought to that area. Interesting. So they had great ships that went out. And then they came back and became very isolated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when um, there was a delegation from England uh, to the uh, imperial court, the emperor said that we have no need for any goods from England. We have everything under the celestial kingdom. I mean, uh, the, the the Ch Chinese made things for themselves and had no need, and of course, that would lead to opium, uh, uh, exports of opium into, the, uh, into China and the and opium wars uh, under, uh, under England. And so, uh, and going back to Africa, it's an interesting use of what I see as a 16th century practice called mercantilism. Flag follows trade. Traders come in, but they're Chinese state enterprises, they're connected to the government. And then comes all kinds of uh, other uh, kind of uh, infrastructure uh, 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 kinds of uh, projects like railroads, roads. These are all built, built by Chinese uh, enterprises. And uh, also, there's uh, unfortunately the wave of manufacturing goods, cheap goods, you know, like plastic buckets, uh, utensils, uh, plates that come and destroy the indigenous <coughs> manufacturing mm, yeah. uh, you know, base yeah. in the smaller countries in yeah. Africa. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, also, uh, and also, they're always uh, connected to education. There's a lot of Confucius Institutes, and uh, they're teaching Chinese in African countries and sending African students to study you know, uh, computers and economics. And, uh, in China? Yeah, in, in China. And, and, uh, 
and all kinds of business in China, and they come back and they're bilingual or trilingual. They speak English and they're friendly uh, to China and, and Swahili and Mandarin. So uh, we don't have that uh, interchange, and uh, that's a, a we program. meaning this country. That's right. Uh, the U.S. Uh, if we were really smart about ourselves. We would admit more students from Africa. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not on the list uh, right now, but they would be really great business and government leaders back in uh, countries like Nigeria or Cameroon or Kenya or uh, Namibia, you know, and, and really be friends of the U.S. But on the other hand, you have to also understand that China, it, it, like the U, uh, always wants to point out it's an ally of the U.S. because it sees anti-Muslim as being anti, uh, <coughs> as being uh, a, a the terrorist terrorist uh, and indeed they're persecuting the uh, Uyghurs in Western right, China right. right now and so uh, they they don't call them uh, you know any anything else than terrorists and so they're they're uh, uh, very much aligned with the US administration aims of countering terrorism and this is yes why don't we why doesn't the US help and support us in suppressing this uh, Islamic terrorism in, in China too yeah yeah well, I, I, find it, I find it very interesting. I mean, this is a complex thing. Because on the one hand, he's contro controlling all the minds. He's folding in. He, you know, he's saying, don't disagree with the, with the government policy. And uh, when, when in doubt, you fold in. You don't, you don't look outside. Sort of like Trump. Um, at the same time, though, he's got a, a very non-Trumpian look at the world because he's, he's doing soft power all over the place. Southeast Asia and Africa, South America, if I didn't mention. And he's building that railroad right into the heart of Europe. He's trying to gain influence everywhere. And that's looking out. And so, uh, you know, the whole thing is he's trying to get influence. And um, it's mercantile, mercantilism. Okay, it's also diplomatic influence. He's becoming, while we watch, a world leader. And the U.S. is becoming, while we watch, a, a world isolationist. Um, so at the end of the day, when you extend those out, uh, what does it mean to him and what does it mean to us? Um, who comes out ahead on that, Ray? Good question. And, uh, and the Chinese always look at long cycles. <laughs> uh, we look at only four years. They're looking at 50, 100 years out and uh, seeing um, the history and, and how they are part of the world order. And you're correct that there's a vacuum today that China is stepping in and saying that we will provide security for you. We will, you know, we, we will protect you against your other enemies by uh, becoming, and, and so little countries- Just play ball with us. Yeah, little countries like Cambodia, that is not part of the South China Seas, are becoming our Chinese allies against uh, the Philippines and Vietnam, right? Yeah. Uh, Pakistan has been a long time uh, Chinese ally uh, because, of course, uh, the, uh, India is, has always had issues with uh, China yeah. over the border. Since 1947. So, so uh, the enemy of the enemy is going to be your friend in many ways. And, and so uh, and the Soviet Union, uh, or uh, ex-Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, really has fallen apart and doesn't have the military uh, presence anymore in the Far East. China is stepping up. And, and so... Um, it, it is uh, able to be a counterweight in, in, the, in that region. And, and of course, the Central Asian states have always tilted toward Russia, but now China, with the road going right through that area to uh, European markets, says, can say, why don't you be part of our a coal prosperity sphere, you know, in a way, uh, you know, talking it's, back to it's Japan. It's an irresistible argument. That's right. And we will give you and, and be part of that logistics, and, and your industries will come out, and you'll be getting higher paying jobs and, and so forth, and Russia will not be able to help you because they're, you know, uh, not as, as economically rich as we are. So, yeah, again, yeah. these are playoffs in each country in the region, really, in the Philippines, have, has gone tilting toward China now. Uh, and, and Taiwan is in a very quandary-like state where, you know, to, to really uh, give up and say you know, the United States is not going to protect us, so we are going to be part of uh, China. But, but still, that has spawned a anti-Chinese backlash in Taiwan, that there are a growing independent people, you know, independence people within uh, Taiwan also. So it is, I don't think it is to China's interest to really push uh, uh, Taiwan at this point. Yeah, to say nothing of Hong Kong. Right. You know, the umbrella movement is history. 
Uh, we, we talked to uh, Michael uh, Davis uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we'll talk to him again. Um, he, he was a professor at Hong Kong University, he talked about you know, the umbrella movement, and, um, and now uh, the, the Chinese have a long plan, as you say, right. and little by little, they're gonna take over Hong Kong. They are taking oh, yeah, over yeah, Hong yeah. Kong. Right. So what you, know, what you find is, um, you know, there's a building somewhere in Beijing where there's a lot of people working on extending Chinese, Chinese influence everywhere in the world. And that, I think, includes the mind control part that applies to the universities and, and the population in general living in China. One interesting thing is in this country, um, you know, there, there, there are the Confucius, Confucius Institutes right, in right. a lot of schools. Yeah. And so in Canada, but recently, Canada got offended with that. I'm not sure what happened. And they dismissed all oh. of the Confucian, Confucian Institu Confucius Institutes. I guess they thought it was somehow threatening to them. And maybe if it's threatening to them, maybe it's threatening to us. We don't seem to care about any of that. And one of the things you mentioned to me in, 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 the, in the break here uh, was the notion that, uh, it's very interesting, was the notion that there are, that they, that there are, if the Chinese students who are here are watched. Oh, yes. Just the way they would be watched in China. And there's a quotient on them too, whether they're following the party line, speaking against China and all that. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really thinking well, this see, whole see, thing it, is global. You see, that's the paradox. You see, uh, I think the conventional wisdom uh, thinking says more people from China, young people, bright people, go to the West, Japan, US, and Europe, and come back, and democracy will bloom and blossom in China. See, that's the conventional thinking. That has not occurred in the last uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 years. Uh, and, but of course, some of them have stayed in, in the U.S., and that's great. They're contributing to Silicon Valley, to New York Finance. A lot of great minds have really uh, been part of our economic revival in many ways. But others have returned to China and uh, tried to fit it back in. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, uh, they cannot be pro-democracy or <laughs> pro uh, another party in, in China. They have to go back to the standard party line. And so uh, they have not transformed China as we thought would happen. Yeah. And, and all this, I, I have to mention that article again. It was something about, it was in The Guardian, I think, yesterday. Uh, it was the decline of democracy in this country. Uh, it's not just Trump. It's, it's been happening, but Trump is accelerating it. And the, the result was uh, is that you know, our democratic institutions and notions are diminishing while we watch. Democracy itself is changing into something not nearly what it was. And I say to myself, gee, that, that comports with, with what Ray is saying about the, you know, potentially aspirational emergence of democracy in China. Democracy, you know, is not as appealing to many places as it used to be. Democracy is not as thriving as it used to be. Democracy is changing to something that isn't what we thought used to be democracy. And it's happening in both places, and maybe other. It's happening certainly in Russia too, isn't it? Yeah, you know you can. You and, know. and of course, it depends on history. That uh, China was very late to modernize. When you have modernization, urban centers and coffee shops and universities—that's where democracy really uh, comes up. And so, even Karl Marx thought that Russia would be the last place to have communism because it was full of serfs and peasants that he believed that it would you know, uh, grow in, in, in uh, Western Europe. Uh, and, and of course, uh, China is late to modernize, and, and of course, uh, and, and it's really becoming nationalistic. And there's one country that has gone through this before, is Germany. And uh, it modernized very late, uh, uh, later than England and France, and also was an independent country as you know, in the 1880s, it finally came together as one country. So it's very late, and it didn't have the democratic institutions yeah. uh, as as other European countries. It takes like, a long time like to England develop and, those institutions. And, and France and others. And England and France went through tumultuous revolutions and uh, Paris Commune and many many uh, you know uh, divisions, but they uh, became stronger, I think, institutional wise. And uh, the Chinese institutions are barely since 1949. <laughs> um, it, it's very recent that they've actually had, uh, you know, countrywide police, uh, you know, schools, um, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, economies. The government didn't come to villages until very recently during the last 20 years. So it's been a struggle for the central government really to 
uh, inculcate a uh, identity as Chinese. So I think you have to look at the other way of seeing, you know, how to bring the country together. We see it as a you know one-party rule. They see it as a way to really bring stability and you know uh, economic uh, uplifting. Very important. To yeah, them. uplifting to the people yeah. where they uh, came from nothing in '49 yeah. out of a war with the Japanese for 20 years. So when we see Xi Jinping doing mind control on the students and the faculty and the universities, on the public in general, making them stay in the box, his, his thought box, the, what is it called, the Xi Jinping thought, um, you know, we get concerned because we think that's pulling away from where we wanted to see them go in terms of, you know, our brand of democracy. Um, on the other hand, it still works, even though it may not be what we want and may be actually chilling to a lot of people. And then you look at this country and you find that the White House is at war with the press. Uh, you find out the First Amendment isn't what it was. You find out that people are having trouble registering to vote. Um, gerrymandering is changing the way the elections work. Uh, Citizens United is uh, changing the way uh, funding of candidates works. There's a lot of things that are undermining our democracy. And look, right now, Congress is dysfunctional. You know, that could not happen in China. It could not happen in China, but it happens here. So you say, well, okay, they may be losing ground in China in terms of the First Amendment, but we aren't in great shape either. That's what I say. What do you say? We just have to work at it as a people. It, a consensus and, and, and a democracy and voting are very messy things. India is an example. They're a democracy. But their uh, standard of living and so forth, uh, compared to China, China has taken off. A and India finally has things that are better. Not as quick, though. It's going to take a much longer time. It's very yeah. messy. And they have uh, politicians who used to be movie stars and so forth. And, and we see uh, there's, it's not the perfect uh, uh, place uh, also. So uh, you're right. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look, ask an uh, average uh, person, uh, Mr. Uh, Wang of uh, uh, Shanghai, whatever, are things better than they were 10 years ago? The answer is yes. Yes. Education, infrastructure, you know, government services, uh, pensions, health care, all are better than it was 10, 15 years ago. How about here? <laughs> Let's leave that one hanging, that's a, Ray. That's a big one. That's another discussion <laughs> altogether. Old, since statehood. This is, a, this is a life after statehood theme. Another, another <laughs> yes, topic. It always comes back <laughs> to the that. statehood. Ray Tsuchiyama, thank, thank you, you so much, much, Ray. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs>